We are talking about judo with Un Yo. Uh, he's written an article on the KL.com blog. Check it out, KL Judo. KL Judo.com. Thank you. KL Judo.com. <laughs> Let me repeat that. KL Judo.com. Check it out. Uh, his th this particular in this interview, pardon me, we're going to be discussing an article he's written called How Do You Develop a Throw? Hello, Un, how are you doing? Great, thanks. Thanks for having me here. Well, thank you for, for joining us uh, again. I have a series of questions in regards to, to your article. I, as I mentioned right from the top, people should check it out on kljudo.com. My first question for you is, actually, before we dive into it, what inspired you to write this particular blog on how to develop a throw? Okay, that, that's actually an interesting question. What happened was... Um, uh, a white belt uh, player from Singapore wrote to me, uh, messaged me and um, said that uh, she was going to be visiting Malaysia in, in a couple of months time and uh, was interested in dropping by my dojo and, and you know, learning some judo. She uh, had some friends who had trained in KL judo before. Uh, some friends uh, from Singapore who had trained in KL judo and uh, 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 so she had heard good things about the club and, uh, you know, she, she wanted to visit and, and learn, uh, some judo and, um, you know, she's a white belt, uh, despite having trained for about a year, uh, because she, she didn't train that frequently. It was like on and off and, you know, having some trouble developing a throw. And while I was uh, chatting with her to know a little bit more about her judo and, you know, what she needs when she comes for, for the visit, uh, she said something to the effect like, I wish I could develop a throw or, or you know, I wish I could, you know, I, I, I could throw someone, you know. So, so obviously she's learned techniques, but in a randori context, she's having difficulty you know, getting the, the getting a throw, and and that's that's a common thing, right? I mean, a lot of beginners learn techniques, and they learn the techniques quite well, but they can't get it to work in a sparring situation, in a randori situation. So that comment by her sparked a, uh, an idea uh, in me to, well, you know, why don't I uh, do a deep dive into what it actually takes to develop a throw? Fascinating. And you've written uh, this blog here, almost 2,000 words. I've, I've, I've read it. And I have some questions. The, the first one I want to ask is in regards to instructor and classical versus modern techniques. Two-part question for you, sir. How do you suggest students approach learning if they are taught by an instructor who focuses on classical version of throws? And a follow-up to that would be, what is the best way for them to adapt to modern competitive techniques okay so um i guess uh uh it also depends on the student because for example i i know one um i have a judo acquaintance from hong kong uh who tra who trains in a in a dojo there which is a very classical uh dojo the, you know it's a it's it's the the judo there is based on kodokan judo and you know the instructor was from the Kodokan and he teaches very classical judo. You know, not, not modern IJF, you know, it's, it's classical. And it's what he likes. It's what the student likes. The, li the student likes that. He wants that. So I think uh, if that's what the student wants, right, and the student is into classical judo, I want to learn classical judo, then that's fine. You don't need to learn modern judo. You know, I mean, if that's what you want. Uh, similarly, there are, uh, students out there who only want to do kata, they want to specialize in kata. You you know what's kata, right? The, right. Form, that yeah. form, right? It's not it's not randori. It's not free 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 practice. Oh, sorry, I need to. The sorry, I guess you can edit out this part. The, there's sure. there's a there's the, my I, I I don't seem to be able to turn off my WhatsApp. So uh, let me let me turn off the sound here. No worries. Then that's a good thing that it's not live. <laughs> Absolutely. At least you can edit. Okay. Sorry. So, so I was saying. So, so you, you're familiar with kata, yeah, right. So, some some students they just want to do kata, right. So, if they want to do kata and they're not interested in randori, they're not interested in shi'ai competition, they don't need to learn modern techniques, right. So, 
I'm not a uh, 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 I, I'm not a evangelist of, uh, of of competition techniques. You know, I, I I say if you want to do kata, that's fine. You, you know, go ahead and do your kata. If you want to learn classical techniques only, go ahead. You know, but in my club, we focus on you know competition style modern judo. That's what we do in my club. So, um, so so you know that's what we push modern judo. And and that that article that you're referring to, uh, uh, is written from that perspective, you know. So, uh, so if a student wants to learn modern judo, then you know uh, there are ways to go about doing that. But I think it's important to point out that it's not necessarily something that I push for everybody. You know, if if you tell me you're interested in classical judo, you're not interested in modern judo, I say power to you. You know, go ahead and pursue your class. I'm not gonna evangelize and say, "Oh, you should, you should adopt modern classical, a uh, modern, modern competitive judo." If that's not what you're interested in, you know, uh, please pursue what you're interested in. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, but um, but if somebody is interested in in modern competition judo, um, it is a problem if they're in a dojo that is very classical. I I I, I have friends and acquaintances who are stuck in that kind of situation where the dojo that they are in is very classical, very traditional, and what they're desperate to learn IJF techniques and they watch IJF videos and wish they could learn these modern techniques, but it's not taught or not even uh, really, it may, in some cases, frowned upon in, in that dojo, you know? And I have I myself have been in dojos earlier in my career. I have been in dojos where... You know, if you did a modern technique like a, you know, a drop kataguruma side takedown, they would frown upon it. They say that that's not real. You know, judo that's that's a bastardization of what you know is classical judo. So, so I know where they're coming from. It's it's actually a bit of a problem if you're in a, a dojo where where uh, the emphasis is classical. And what I would say first of all is that if there is a dojo in your area that emphasizes more on competition and that's what you're interested in then probably you have to switch dojos hmm. but what if i guess the natural question is what if there there are no competitive dojos around and and your dojo is classical the next dojo is also classical the next dojo <laughs> everywhere around you is classical and that that some people are caught in that type of situation right then in in such a situation i i guess the best you can do is uh, you can learn from online resources. Uh, yeah. Nowadays, there are a lot of videos. You know, Jimmy Pedro and Travis Stevens has a ha- have a website called American Judo System where they teach modern competitive judo. Fighting Films has a has a website, Superstar Judo, where they teach modern competitive judo. And there are others. You know, uh, online where you can buy uh, videos. You can buy you know high quality instructional videos sometimes from world and Olympic champions, you know, and, and learn modern competitive, modern competitive judo. Uh, it's not the same thing as having a coach who can teach you that, you know, a live coach who can teach you and guide you and give you feedback. It's not the same thing, but it's still better than nothing. And, and you know, learning from video. And uh, I guess that's, that's what you'll have to turn to if you can't get it in your dojo, right? right. Hopefully... Hopefully, even if they don't teach it, you know, at least they tolerate it. That means in Randuri, if you if you were to do a modern competitive technique, they won't frown upon it and say that that's wrong. You know, hopefully they'll tolerate as long as it works, it's clean, it's legal. Okay, we'll tolerate. We don't teach it, but if you're able to pull off that unusual technique and it's clean and legal and doesn't injure people, maybe they'll allow it, you know. A real problem would arise if they, you know, you do a nice clean technique. It's legal. It doesn't hurt anybody, and they, and they still frown upon it and say that well, that doesn't look classical. That that's that's not real judo. Then that's really a problem. <laughs> you know, right. if if you're the type of person who is into competition judo and you're in that kind of dojo, you probably need to move to another another do, dojo. Speaking of, uh, you mentioned randori. Uh, I wanted to know in terms of understanding resistance in 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 Randori, how can a judo practitioner systematically prepare for that active resistance encountered in Randori? 
Can you elaborate on any specific drills or exercises that can simulate this resistance during practice? Actually, um, the, the, the best way to, uh, to, 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 to get used to randori is, is, is to just dive into it and do randori, do lots of randori, you know, and learn through trial and error. Uh, uh, you know, you, you can't, I mean, you could do some drills, I guess, but why do drills to prepare for randori when you can just do randori? You know, uh, right. you do, I mean, drills are important. Drills are important, and we can talk about that later on if you want, about the importance of drills to, to throwing. But drills are not uh, 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 necessarily the best way to prepare for randori. The best way to prepare for randori is to do randori. Just dive in and go in there and uh, jump in, you know, jump into the deep end of the uh, of the pool and, and just, just find your way around. You know, I really think so. I really believe that. You know, that's how I learned as well. You go in there and at first you're going to get thrown. You're going to get countered. Nothing's going to work. But uh, the more you do it, the more you get used to the feel of randori, get used to the defenses of your opponent. You learn to overcome those defenses. You learn to evade counters and stuff like that. And you learn by doing. So to answer your question, the best way is to just dive in and just do it and do lots of it. Excellent. Uh, and the next question I have, you mentioned like video resources, right? You've mentioned the usage of, you know, if, if you're in a situation where there are no modern judo dojos around, you're probably going to have to lean on, on the internet, social media, et cetera, to, to get your information. You mentioned fighting films uh, in the article. How should a beginner judoka evaluate and choose the right videos and how do they ensure they are learning techniques that align with modern judo? And I ask this, I know you, you just mentioned there's a lot of content out there. And there sure is, uh, especially on, on YouTube. But sometimes, I guess there are varying degrees of, of quality instruction videos, if, if I can say. And I'm not knocking any of, of these videos. I'm not a judo expert. I'm a judo fan. But I've I've looked at some videos, instructional videos online. And I, I find that... Uh, there's a dichotomy in terms of how much instruction is provided, how many different scenarios are looked at, and the detail of, of the instruction in the video. Do you know what I mean? As opposed to just, just watching yes. someone get dropped on, on, on their back for, for Epon. So Yes, I, I, that's a really good question, a really relevant question, which is, you know, uh, what kind of videos can you trust, right? Basically, I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there, huh? free stuff as well as paid stuff. And if you watch the wrong thing, then you learn the wrong thing, right? So how I think your question is that how do you know? That's you know, it. if you're if you're not an expert and you're just learning, how do you know that I can trust this source or I'm learning the right thing? Um, the reason I mentioned fighting films in my article is that uh they are they are a trusted resource. You know, in general, you can't go wrong with fighting films. They're really good, they're professionals, they know what they're doing, the production quality is good, the, the technical quality is good. And, and the voiceovers are great too. <laughs> Neil Adams. <laughs> but but I think I think the 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 good thing about fighting films is this. Um I mentioned it in my article that you know the Japanese, uh, the Japanese champions, they have a tendency to show the classical Kodokan version of techniques. You know, so if you get a great champion, you know, you name it, you know, whoever, Inoue, Koga, whoever, you get any of those great champions. And they go on these clinics and they demonstrate techniques and they tend to show the classical way. A, a lot of the times they, they tend not, not to show the actual way that, that they did it in competition. This is quite commonplace. It's quite well known. I, I remember talking to Shintaro Higashi. Do you, do you know him? She, yeah. Or you know him? Yeah, the, the, New, him, York, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the New York uh, uh, a coach, quite famous. He, he, and he's Japanese-American, right? And I asked him, I said, why, why is that? Why do the Japanese, you know, they, you, you, you see their videos or you go to their clinics and you see this great champion and you want to learn their technique and they're showing the classical technique. And he said, I don't know, but that's what they do. You know, maybe they just feel an obligation to show the, the classical way. Maybe it's, a, it's just the ethos mm. of the Japanese. They should show the proper classical 
official version, you know, rather than their their version, which which you know, which which is a uh, unorthodox. Maybe they feel they should not be showing unorthodox techniques, right? But what fighting films has done, and they've 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 done videos with uh with with Japanese with several Japanese champions, right? Is th- is that they've managed to persuade them or coax them or you know appeal to them to to actually show how it is actually done you know and and so if you watch uh, for example uh the uh, instructional video with Koga so you get to see how Koga actually does or how Koga actually did all his uh you know unusual techniques so fighting films has been able to to get uh, the the champions feature to actually show the 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 way it was done in competition rather than just the classical version. So fighting films is renowned for that. They're good at that. And so very, very uh reliable. So if you go with them, can't go wrong, you know? Um may I ask they, sorry, real, real quick, yeah. even for pure beginners, let's say you're crossing over from from another grappling sport uh and mm-hmm. you have no understanding of, of of judo uh or even if let's say you're just a pure beginner in martial arts as as a whole, you're 16 and you want to learn. Like, do you think that high level quality content is also applicable to to, to them? Good question. Really good question. Uh, I think it's a little bit uh, above their. It will go over their heads. I, I think. I think it's 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 sort of like because it's very high level advanced stuff. So if you are an absolute beginner or you're not at all familiar with judo, let's say you do some other martial arts and you want to learn judo, um, most of the titles uh, in fighting films are, are are really advanced level, high level competition stuff by Olympic champions or world champions. So actually not that suitable, not that suitable. But having said that, there are a few titles that they have uh, that cater specifically to beginners. So uh, so, so there is content in there uh, that that's suitable for beginners, but not all. And actually, the bulk of the content is is quite advanced stuff. It's meant for really. When I look at it, I think it's meant for black belts. Mm. It's meant for black belts to they get even or brown belts to get even. It's really not sort of meant for yellow belts. You know, who who don't even really know or white belts who don't really even know techniques yet. You know, so that's what I would say. Um, you know, another a really good source is is Jimmy Pedro and Travis Stevens' uh, uh, website called American Judo System. You can look it up on Google, and they've got basic stuff. They've also got advanced stuff. So, and and those two are very credible. You know, and and uh, the 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 quality of uh, of the videos uh, is very good. So, I can recommend that as well. And and they they have actually quite a lot more of basic judo uh compared uh, they've got a lot of advanced stuff as well but they they i think deliberately they deliberately uh try to cater to 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 some beginners as well so if you're a beginner or you're from some other uh grab some other martial arts or grappling sport and you want to learn judo fundamentals of judo it's it's a pretty good place to start this american judo system very interesting. I just want to quickly mention. I remember uh, I'm familiar with, with fighting films, of course, and I remember they they did one with with uh, they did maybe more than one with the Georgians, but uh, I remember there was one yes. with Trekishvili, I believe it was, yes, demonstrating yes. Uh, just various Yornagi setups and all that. And I remember, like in terms of the camera angle and and the way they captured it, it is fantastic. It is incredible. Even if you have yeah. no interest in judo or combat sports as a whole, uh, even from a cinematography, if I can. You just want to watch it, right? It's incredible, man. It is stunning stuff. Like I, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I, I remember watching those clips because I, I love, I, I love throws, that, especially lifts, man. I, there's just something incredible, and the landing and everything from from both a visual. You know, storytelling perspective, blah blah. But it's just stunning visuals, man. And yeah. um, and and if I can ask, just just a, a quick follow up. Obviously, I'm I'm interviewing you from Canada. Uh, 
you know, we speak English here, we speak French. And 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 I know that judo judo is a global sport. Obviously, there's resources that I, I've come across instructionals from uh, different parts of the world where where the video is not in English per se. It could be in, in Japanese, French, and, and so on. Um, I guess what I'm asking is, do, do you know if there's any other series? I mean, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but, uh, but do you know if there's any other instructional series that are non-English that that you would recommend, be it if it's Japanese instructional uh, or from anywhere else in the world? Not really. You know, I mean, they are not, a, unlike BJJ, which has a lot of resources, right? There are a lot of websites selling BJJ instructionals, tons, right? In judo, there are not a lot of sources of that. You know, there's, there's fighting films, right? There's uh, the American judo system by Jamie Pedro and Travis Stevens. And there's this thing called, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of it, judo fanatics, which, which, which Travis Stevens is involved in. And, um, and that one, they've got a lot of titles as well. And, and that's basically it. You know, I mean, you know, you've got a few other odd sites that sell judo videos, but you know, these three are the main resources of, of, of videos. You know, there are some product, there are some video productions from Japan, but they're not online. They are, they're actually DVDs that you have to buy. Uh, you could, you could buy them from Amazon Japan, but they're very expensive. And like I said, they tend to show very traditional judo. You know, you buy yeah. a, DVD from a great champion and you hope to see how he did it in the Olympics or the world championships. And then you watch it and it's like, he's showing me Kodokan judo, you know, and you feel that you've, you've just wasted your money. So, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, there, there's a whole, there are several series of, of do, you, do you know this uh, great champion, great late champion, Koga? Have you heard of him? Yes, of course. Yeah, you he, bro- yeah, yeah. Expert, yeah. he passed away a few years ago. Mm. And he's done a whole bunch of videos. I mean, he's done many different series of videos, DVDs in Japan. And he's done, uh, you know, one with fighting films. And the one with fighting films is the best. I mean, um, because the one in fighting films, he's showing what he did in competition, right? right. But uh, I have bought DVDs of Koga from Japan, which is in Japanese, right? And he's showing techniques that he doesn't do. I mean, he's showing, you know, Ochigari. I've never seen him do Ochigari. He's showing Uchimata, Haraigoshi. You know, these are not techniques that he he does, you know. So he's just like sort of teaching basic judo. You know, and I I I don't I mean I, I didn't buy a Koga DVD to learn basic judo from him. You know, <laughs> that's not that's not the purpose of buying a Koga DVD. I want to see how he did it at the Olympics, you know? Right, right. So, so, so I wouldn't really recommend Japanese DVDs unless uh, Japanese videos um, that are made by uh, fight, fighting films, those are good. Yeah. And I, I just one, one last thing before we transition to the, to the following question. I remember yeah. also seeing the Mongolians featured on fighting films on, on their scenes mm. just to show their style of judo and again i i thought that was that was a great uh addition to to their collection um because it's all their videos are great i, I think right. all their videos are great. i mean production qualities are uh you know absolutely you know uh broadcast quality you know this mm-hmm. is the yeah in the and, article, and also technical, technical as well technical as well They're, the production values are really good but it's not just good production values you know the direction and Everything is good. I mean, I, I do recommend it highly. For sure. Uh, we're just going to move move on to the next question here. Uh, in the article, you've expressed some skepticism about the ongoing utility of Uchikomi once the throw is learned. Can you elaborate more on this and explain why this traditional practice might not be as valuable in modern judo training? Yeah, I mean, this is a little bit of heresy on my part, right? Because if you go to any judo club, right? 99.9% of judo clubs will say, do more uchikomi, do more uchikomi. Uchikomi is essential. You know, you have to do uchikomi, you know. I, I remember, uh, you know, people saying things like, yeah, you know, uchikomi is like, you know, uh, doing uchikomi is like sharpening a knife. You know, if you have a knife and it becomes dull and then you do more uchikomi, it becomes sharp, you know. So that's that's the perception, you know. But, and, and, and indeed, the Japanese do a lot of uchikomi. You know, so people see the Japanese doing uchikomi do as the Japanese do because they're so great 
in judo. But uh, you know, just because they do that doesn't mean that they're great because of it, right? They they might be great in spite of it, right? It's just like you know, people say could say, oh, Tom Cruise is a Scientologist, right? Is he a great filmmaker and a great actor because of Scientology, or is he great in spite of it, right? He might have been a great uh, uh, actor even if he was a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Christian or a, or or a, a Muslim or whatever, right? But he happens to be a Scientologist, and of course, he ascribes his success to Scientology. But maybe it's not because of Scientology. Maybe he's just a great actor and he's a great filmmaker, right? Mm. So you know, the Japanese might might do uh, tons of uchikomi, but maybe that's not the reason why. They're so successful. Maybe it's because they do two hours of randori a day, right? On top of the, the, the one hour, just because they do uchikomi doesn't mean that that's the reason they're successful, right? And, and I'm convinced that that's not the reason that they're successful because you see, uchikomi, I mean, for the uninitiated, you know, those of, who are listening, they may not know what, what this means. Uchikomi is, uh, I guess, the loosely translated as fit ins. Right, as it's when when you do the entry into a technique, and you lift the person, but you don't finish the throw, you don't actually throw. When you throw, it's called nage komi. Right, that's when you finish the throw and you actually do the full movement. Uchikomi is half a movement. You come in, you enter, and then then you abort. Right, so that's uchikomi, and it's useful when you're first learning a technique. When you're first learning a technique like Ippon Seonage, right? A back carry throw. You need to learn how to enter into the throw, how to get the rotation, how to lift the person onto your back. You need to get that feeling. And you get that feeling through Uchikomi. In that, in, in that regard, Uchikomi is very useful for you to learn the entry into the throw. It's very useful. What I'm saying is that once you've learned it, once you've mastered it, right? Like for example, Ippon Sionagi is a technique I use, you know, and I, I, I know it inside out. Uh, it's it's a it's a technique that that I know well. Why should I do uchikomi? There's there's no use. I already know it. The purpose of uchikomi is to teach you the entry into the technique. I already know the entry into the technique. Why do I need to? To, to do uchikomi when I already know the entry into the technique. So what I need to do is more randori. That's what I need to do. I need to fight people who are able to defend my seonagi and then I need to come up with new ways to overcome those defenses, new ways to overcome counters to, to my uh, seonagi. Uchikomi will do me no good. I already know the technique. If I already know the technique, I don't need to, uh, you know, to, to like like let's say you already uh know how to cook a, a dish right you're you're learning cooking and you learn to cook your favorite dish you've already learned it you've already mastered it. you've been cooking that dish for ten years do you need to read the recipe book again you don't you've already cooked it for ten years right right you need that recipe book and you need to learn the basics of cooking a dish when it's new to you. If I give you a new dish, you've never cooked it before. Ah, then you need the recipe and then you need the, the methodology, right? But if you've been cooking it for 10 years or 20 years, you don't need the recipe book. So what I'm saying is that uchikomi is useless once you've already mastered the technique. You know? And in fact, um, like I said, it's very useful for learning the entry into the technique, but that's all it teaches you. The entry it doesn't even teach you how to finish the technique. To finish the technique, you need to do nagekomi. All right? So you have to do uchikomi, learn the entry, then you have to do nagekomi to learn the finishing. Hmm. But uchikomi and nagekomi alone can't possibly be enough because it's done, these are done against or on a cooperative partner. All right? So in order to learn how to really do the throw, you have to do it against a uncooperative partner, a resisting partner. And that happens in randori. So randori is crucial. 
quick follow-ups here uh, there regarding Randori. Uh, you mentioned that the, the Japanese will do, this is on, on the national team, the, they'll do two hours of Randori, right? Uh, yeah. Is that, is that, I guess what I'm asking is, can you paint the picture from what you know in terms of their schedule, their training schedule? Are you saying they do Randori, two hours of Randori, seven days a week? Yes, in they, they addition, do it practically every day. They, they might take maybe half a day off on Sunday. Some some clubs might do that. But basically every day, they do, do about an hour and a half to two hours of randori. They also do a... They, they, the Japanese spend a, a huge amount of time on warm-ups. Their warm-ups can last anywhere from, you know, half an hour to an hour. Really, a lot of warm-ups, which which uh, Western judokas are not used to because we, we don't do so much warm-ups. Like at my club, we don't really do a lot of warm-ups, right? They... they Come in, we just warm up a little bit. We get going, you know, with, with the program. But the Japanese, they do a lot of warm-ups. It's just part of the tradition. And um, so if you're not used to that, you might find it a little bit boring. But then, you see, at that level, when you're talking about national team level, high-level judo, they, 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 they've all got their techniques already. They just need to do the randori, right? They just need to do the randori. And so they, 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 do, they, they don't really spend a lot of time on technical and stuff like that anymore. They, they, they go in there, it's just really randori heavy, right? They do a lot of randori and that's the secret to their success. If you do that much randori, you get really good. You know, and, and I know this is a big leap when I make this uh, statement here, and, and because when you say two hours of randori a day, um, obviously that, that that's that's incredible. Right. I mean, for a whole. I mean, the average person, if the average person did that for a week. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't know if they would uh, be able to move on the eighth day. And I mean, we're comparing apples and oranges here, folks. Well, well yeah, I, I should point out. I mean, you know, this is something that that uh, I, I heard Jimmy Pedro speak about in a, in a podcast that he did, where is that? You know, the, 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 the randori that is done in Japan is actually a little bit different from the randori that is done in, in Europe, right? Because in Europe, it's very physical. It's very physical. It almost feels like a competition. You know, the randori mm -hmm. is really hard. I mean, I, I trained in Europe. Right? And there were times, for example, when uh, fist fights would, would break out, you know? I mean, <laughs> it, it, it was that hard. I mean, I was in one... Uh, session in the Budokai in London when you know wow. uh, actually Neil Adams students came and uh, I was from the Camberley club and the Camberley club was there and there were other you know players from different clubs and and there was one time one of my friends got into a fist fight in you know in, in the middle of a randori with with one of Neil Adams students and they, they 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 were throwing punches you know we had to break it up and all that because it was that rough you mm. know it, it it's it's, a, it's really hard physical. Randori, and, and you can't possibly do two hours of that, you know. But in Japan, um, the 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 randori is a little bit different. It's more free flowing. It's not so hardcore, you know. They're trying out stuff. It's a lot of free flow, and also uh, they like to do this one thing, which is uh, colloquially called uh, motodachi, where they put somebody out there, you know, who's the the motodachi. And he stays out there for, for an hour, you know, I mean, or, or, or more. Just, just taking on new partners, right? So uh, without any rest, without any water breaks, you're just out there for an hour, taking on new partners every five minutes or whatever. And so how can you possibly do that, right? The only way you can do that is to conserve your energy. And when you're fighting, you're not going all out, you know, headbutting and, and going, you know, uh, brutal and all that. You, you're, you're doing free flow, you're a little bit more defensive and conserving your energy. And so it's a different type of, of, of randori. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's two hours, but it's not two hours of European style randori. It's not. It's it's different. Uh, like I said, more free flowing and more. Um, yeah, I would, I'm not sure if this is the right term to use, but a little bit more relaxed, mm. a little bit more relaxed and free flowing compared to the, the European style of, of rendering. Either way, it sounds like a lot of calories are being burned in, in those two hours it, over, you know. It's still over, hard, yeah, it's still hard, yeah. you know, two hours. Yeah. But it's, it's good, you know, I, I believe in that. I believe in that, you know, and and I, I, I think that it's good to do 
a lot of randori. You just got to do a lot of randori. I mean, it's like in any sport, right? I mean, if uh, if you're if you're, in, you're talking about soccer, right? You can do drills, sure. You do drills, you do strength training, you do speed work, but you've got to play soccer. You've got to get onto the field and play soccer to become good at soccer, right? If you want to be a swimmer, right? Sure, they have drills that they do and strength training and 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 different types of exercises. But at the end of the day, you've got to swim, right? If you're a marathon runner, you can do you know strength training and 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 stretching and and drills and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you got to hit the road and you got to run. If you're a basketball player, lots of drills, lots of you know exercises, but you've got to play basketball, right? So what is playing judo? Playing judo is right dory. So if you want to get good at judo, you've got to spend a lot of time doing rendering. No two ways around it. Quick uh, follow-up before I give you the, the next question here, before I ask you the next question. How much randori do does KL judo? How, how, how much do you guys do? Okay. At the moment, we don't do as much as I would like uh, uh, for us to do. Uh, we try to do a minimum of, of half an hour. Okay. Uh, minimum. But, you know, on a good day when we have the right number of people uh, and the, the right type of people, then we could do an hour, right? But that is quite rare because right now, you know, we're a small club. We don't have a lot of people. And what I mean by the right type of people is, let's say you have a class on a particular day and, you know, 70% of the class or 60% of the class are beginners, mm. white belts who don't have technique. You can't do an hour of randori, right? They don't have the techniques to do randori. But in contrast, let's say you have a class and it's 90% experienced players. Players, black belts, brown belts, blue belts, or green belts, people with experience, people who have technique, right? And and and, and it's and all everybody, you know, 90 to 100 percent of the class is experienced. Then you can you can have more randori. So you have to cater to the class. If the class has a lot of beginners, you can't do so much randori. Right. And so uh so so it depends on the number of people that's available be- and, and also uh the 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 level, the level of, of the people who are present. I mean, obviously, if you only have three people on the mat on that day, you can't do that much randori. You could recycle and re- you know go around Robin and okay, let's do the same randori five, seven. Nine, ten times with the same partner, you could do that, and sometimes we do do that. But um, but uh, you want to have variety if possible, right? If possible, you don't want to just do ten randoris with the same person, right? Okay. If you have to, you do it. But ideally, you have partners to different partners to randori with. But sometimes uh, the number of people on the mat is not there. Yeah. So. Right. Uh, so my hope uh, is that over time, we will grow the club so that uh, two things happen. Number one, we have more people, just the number of people uh, is, is increases. And also uh, more, you know, a higher number of experienced people so that we could have, you know, maybe even a day that's designated just for randori. And we just do two hours of randori like the Japanese. I would love that you know, if we could do that. <laughs> Okay, okay. Today, Wednesday is a randori day. All right. We only right. do randori. I would love that. I would love that. But it will take time. You have to grow your club to a point where you have sufficient number of members and you know a sufficient number of experienced players. In the article, uh, and in terms of uh, adaptation and variation, how does a judoka ad- uh, adapt? Let me repeat that. How does a judoka adapt a throw to a different opponent with various body types and strategies and how much variations from the learned technique is advisable to make it work in different contexts? Okay, great question. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes that beginners make is that um, if they've successfully developed a technique against a specific training partner, let's say I'm training with you and I've been working with you for weeks or months on a technique. Uh, let's say it's Seiwa Inage, right? And I've been working with you and I've managed to figure out a version of Seiwa that works on you. Whenever we randori, I usually catch you once or twice with it. 
and, and it works really well for you. But you're of a certain body type, a certain weight, you know, a certain height. Mm. It doesn't mean that that technique will work on another person who is a different body type, different weight, different height, different movement styles, you know, and and uh, and it would be a mistake to try to use the exact same technique on a, another person with a different body type. But that's a common mistake that beginners make, you know, and sometimes it can be actually dangerous, okay? For example, let's say you do Seonage against, uh, let's say you're a 60 kilo player and you do it against another 60 kilo player. You do that particular Seonage and it works, right? And then you meet, sometimes in, in, in the dojo, you have to fight somebody bigger. That's quite common. And you happen to go up against a guy who's 90 kilos, mm. 60 kilos and 90 kilos, right? By right, you should be focusing on ashiwaza, foot sweeps and slightly more defensive type things. And you come in for a, a seo enage, you get crushed by the 90 kilo guy. If the 90 kilo guy is not, if he's experienced, he'll know how to avoid injuring you. What if he's not experienced? And you come in and try to throw him and he crushes you. You could break up some bones, you know, or, or, or worse, right? Because you're doing the, the technique that works on a 60 kilo guy. It's not going to work on a 90 kilo guy. You got to do something else, right? Maybe you need to do drop seonagi, or maybe you need to do, you know, a, a, a different version, not the version that works on a 60 kilo player. Or, or maybe seonagi may not work against a 90 kilo guy. Maybe you need to focus on other techniques. You can't fight everybody the same way, right? But, um, so, so your question is that how many different variations? I don't think that there's a number, you know. I mean, you you every every person you fight is different. And through trial and error, doing lots of randori, you figure out ways to make it work. You know, if I'm fighting you for the first time, I don't know how you move, I don't know how you feel, and I've just got to do trial and error, I'll get countered, I'll get blocked, and then eventually over time, I'll figure out a way to penetrate your defenses and get my technique to work. But uh, there's no there's no limit. I mean, if I've got 10 different training partners, maybe I have to come up with 10 different variations. Not major differences. Sometimes it's just a small difference. Maybe a little bit different in terms of the gripping. Maybe a little bit deeper entry. Maybe a little bit wider entry. Maybe a drop. You know, it's, it's not something very radical, maybe it's just a small tweak just to make it work. In the article, we you mentioned uh, the importance of complementary throws, right? Uh, you touched on the concept of having complementary throws, like coupling the Ipon Sinanagi and the Kuchimaki Komi. Um, yes. Can you elaborate on the process of selecting and in, in integrating these complementary techniques? Okay, so, you know, uh, in the world of judo, uh, complementary throws or throws that go well together with, you know, uh, throws that go well together are, are quite well established. Right? You don't really have to discover them. Like, for example, if you ask any experienced uh, competitive coach, uh, you know, what can I do? What can I do with my Ippon Seonagi? Right? The coach will tell you, Kochi Makikomi. Right? That's a very established throw that goes well with Ippon Seonagi. Right? They, may, they might say, do Ippon Osoto. That works well as well. Uh, so, you know, for any throw that, that, that you mentioned, there are, you know, a number of complementary throws that are well established. And if you have a good coach or you have a good video resources that you can refer to, fighting films, you know, the Jimmy Pedro stuff that I mentioned, they'll show you what those complementary throws are. So you don't have to discover them or invent them. Uh, they're, they're, they're pretty established. These are all very well established. And you'll see them also on, you know, on, on videos uh, put out by the IGF, right? The IGF World Tour. You watch the World Tour, you'll see players doing complementary throws, right? You know, and and, and you can you can get ideas from there. But uh, but like I said, these are well established. Uh, there's no need to try to invent something new. Uh, you just have to uh, 
do a little bit of research and you can figure them out, right? Okay, I do Uchimata. What goes well with Uchimata? These are all established. Kochigari goes well with Uchimata, you know, for example. Right. Um, yeah. If, if I could just, uh, no pun intended, I guess, throw in something in here. Like in terms of... Uh... If, if we're talking about the, the IGF circuit, we, and, and you mentioned, yeah, these sequ- the sequence of throws, these complementary throws are, are well established. Which, in your opinion, which country or competitor comes to mind when you think of the most unexpected sequence of complementary throws that you wouldn't expect? Do you know what okay, I mean? Like, I'm, I'm orthodox. Yeah, like w- which when you see it, you're like, this makes it's it's amazing that this even worked. It's almost luck. <laughs> it's almost it's an anomaly in the sense that it's just too random to make okay. sense. Which country or player has the most unconventional sequence or uh, you know trajectory? Well, it, it, I know a no, lot no, of it no. is situational. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. I think the most conventional ones would, would, would be Japan, of course, right? Right. Japan are really good at combinations, but very classical and it, it's 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 expected, right? Uh, um I would say a lot of uh in general, unorthodox judo, not just combinations, but unorthodox judo comes from places like Georgia, Azerbaijan, uh Uzbekistan. Uh, Kazakhstan, to a certain extent, Russia as well. You know, these type of places, uh, you know, they produce Mongolia, right? Very unorthodox judo, right? Sometimes you see unorthodox stuff come out of Korea as well. Sometimes you do see that. But, um, but, uh, interestingly, you know, a lot of these, uh, a, a, a lot of judo from so-called Western democracies are are actually quite kind of orthodox. Mm. You know, uh, American judo is very influenced by Japanese judo. Canadian judo is very influenced by Japanese. So is Brazilian judo. Uh, and you know, you go to when when you go to France and Germany and Spain and, and the UK, a lot of the judo is pretty conventional relative to what you see. From Georgia or right. Azerbaijan or Mongolia or Kazakhstan, you know. I mean, of course, you have uh the occasional player who's very unorthodox from France or from Germany, uh, you know, and so on. But in general, the judo in these uh Western democracies uh tend to be uh more classical, actually. You know, if you look at Neil Adams judo, I mean this is some time back. But Neil Adams' judo was very classical, very beautiful classical judo. It wasn't unorthodox, you know. And if you look at Mike Swain from the United States, he was the first American male world champion. It's very Japanese-style judo. In fact, he he trained in Japan. And his judo is very classical, very beautiful. I mean, from Canada, uh, this Kyle Ries fella, his judo is very beautiful classical judo, you know. So not very unorthodox at all. So if you want to see very unusual judo, it'll be from places like Georgia and so on. Years ago, uh, when I started watching, you know, international judo and stuff, a a lot of the times it was just clips, to be honest, on YouTube that was available. Uh, And I remember, this is not that long ago, but it's long ago enough. Do you remember Sobirov? Yeah, Rishon Sobirov. Yeah, and, and I remember thinking, like, holy moly, this is just incredible to watch this guy just move like that and just be, I mean, I if you want to call it un, un, unconventional or whatnot, but it was just so dynamic, so explosive, you know, it was, uh, yeah. I got I to gotta find that clip. There was one one highlight, I love those highlights, but I remember seeing that highlight and, and my mind just went like, Anyways, anyway, so moving on, I appreciate that uh, that, that that answer there. I, I want to move on to the um, topic of, and you you kind of mentioned this before. I hope you don't mind us diving deeper into this. Um, Japanese champions teaching classical versions, and I th- you mentioned this in your in your article. 
this might be a touchy subject, but what are the cultural or traditional reasons behind Japanese champions often teaching classical versions of their favorite techniques? I know you spoke about this already, but a follow up to that I want to know is how do you perceive this practice impact? How do you perceive this practice impacts the global evolution of judo? Okay, so so the the first part of your question is that why they do it is is that is that the the first part of the question? Correct. Why they? I I, I as I had mentioned earlier, I did ask uh, Shintaro, right, who's who's Japanese American and has mm. some connection to Japan, and he's gone to Japan and trained in Japan. He's Japanese, you know, and his father is, of course, very traditional Japanese judo instructor. Ask him why, and he's he says he's not sure himself, but it's what they do, right? And if I had to speculate, uh, I I think the reason has to to do with just tradition. They feel an obligation to demonstrate the traditional technique, you know, because they they all respect the Kodokan. The Kodokan has an established official traditional version of the technique and they feel a kind of obligation or a duty to present the classical version and maybe they feel it's wrong to show uh, uh, an unorthodox version you know uh, it's okay to do it in competition and get an ipon and win a gold medal but it's not okay to show it you know I, I I'm just guessing. I mean, but right. but definitely it is a fact. I mean, you can ask anybody who's a connoisseur of videos if they you know about Japanese judo videos. It's always very disappointing because a lot of the times they uh, they they just don't show the way it's actually done, but they show the classical way. It's very right. frustrating, right? So the second part of your question was how does this impact? Uh, the development of judo worldwide, right? I, I think it actually has a negative impact because a lot of senseis, a lot of teachers are, are, are very influenced by this classical approach and they teach things where in some cases, I mean, the best example I can give is that of Ippon Seonage, right? Uh, and Ippon Seonagi, the classical way of, of doing Ippon Seonagi is to throw with a grip on Uke's sleeve. But internationally in competitions, everybody, everybody does it off the lapel grip, not the sleeve grip. I mean, if you watch it, 95% of the times, it's, it's, it's off the lapel not the sleeve. You'll find an occasion, I mean, it, this is not to say it can't be done off the sleeve, it's just not as efficient, right? Mm -hmm. So people will point out, oh yeah, okay, there's a clip of uh, Ricky Nakaya doing it off the sleeve. So it can be done off the sleeve? Yes, of course it can be done. But 95% or maybe 99% of Ippon Seonage, whether it's standing or drop, is done off the lapel, it's not done off the sleeve. But 99% of teachers out there will teach it off the sleeve. So why, why do they do that? Because they watch these Japanese champions teach it off the sleeve. Right? So, so it does have a negative impact. Uh, you know, they should be teaching it the proper way. That, Or rather, they should be teaching it not the proper way. Maybe the proper way is defined by the Kodokan, uh, right? Which is to do it off the sleeve. I should say they should teach it the most effective way which is the way it is done in competition, right? If it's done in competition, by definition, it's the most efficient, effective way. That's why it's done in competition, right? That's why it works in competition. If it wasn't effective and it wasn't efficient, it wouldn't work, right? Uh, so if you watch how it's done in competition, it's done off the lapel. It's not done off the sleeve. But like I said, you go to 99 out of 100 clubs, the sensei will teach you, Seoenage of the sleeve. And that's a direct impact of these Japanese champions and Japanese senseis teaching the classical version. The irony is that all these Japanese players do it off the lapel as well. They don't do it off the sleeve. Koga does it off the lapel. You know, uh, uh, Abinuma does it off the lapel. 
when Nomura does Ipon Sionagi, he mainly does Morote Sionagi, but when he does Ipon Sionagi, it's off the lapel. You know, all the players who do Sionagi do it off the lapel. But it's taught there off the sleeve, right? So that, that's a problem. And that's just one example. There are other examples I could, I could give, you know, of Osotogari. The way Osotogari is taught is not the way it's done in competition. The, the traditional way it's taught is not the way it's done in competition. So there are lots of examples of that, right? And uh, I think this is a problem. I think it does uh, negatively impact the way judo is taught and developed around the world. You know, I'm going to have to move on from this topic because I have so many follow-up questions to ask uh, and 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 really open, the, as they say, the, the Pandora's box of, of just because it's, it's there's just so much there, you know. And I, I speak as a fan, folks, you know, I, I, I a fan of the sport, um, but also looking at it from, from a different perspective of uh, – why is that? Like it's just it's it's bizarre, you know. And 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 I say that respectfully. Uh, it I, is bizarre. No, it is know? bizarre. I, and, I, I, and, I, and, and 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 uh, I I have I have um, as I'm sure you do as well. I, I have people that I know, people that I respect, who are um, they they love the traditional style, and and I, I'm not knocking any of that, but I I would say. Um, you know, if you look at other sports, what would be the the most similar analogy? As you mentioned, the 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 vis a vis the sleeve versus the the lapel. I, I guess from a communication perspective, what analogy could we use? Well, it doesn't have to be sports related, but like because it's it sounds to me you're, you're describing a scenario where in competition that is the most realistic scenario you can get. No, oh, I, I tell you. I, I've had this conversation with uh, uh, one one of my students uh, before when who was learning competition judo, and we came up with this conclusion. This is going to be controversial, and and many will say it's heresy, but I would say that judo stands out as probably the only sport, the only Olympic sport, where the way it is taught in most clubs, right, it's not the way the game is played. Right. Whereas, you know, in, in 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 other Olympic sports, right, you're taught the way it's played. You're, you're not taught a classical version that doesn't really apply in, in competition. You're taught the competition version in, in virtually every other sport. But judo stands alone as a as a unique case where the where how it is taught is often very different from how it is displayed. Judo stands alone in that regard. So it's hard for me to give you an analogy from another sport because other sports don't do this. So, uh, uh, you know, and and the, 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 the irony, like I said, is that, you know, these Japanese champions, they'll demonstrate all the classical versions, but if you watch how they actually fight, it's not the classical version. It's not classical at all, right? So you you know this uh this this player, this great sixty kilo player named Takato. Does that name? Yes, yes, ring of course. Yes. Judo is very, yeah, his judo is very unusual, very unorthodox, very interesting, but but quite unusual, especially he got, for he, he got caught in a Juju right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you know career, he does right? side down and he does right. you know very. Very unusual front uchimata and stuff like that, right? Uh, I've never seen him give a clinic or whatever, but it would be interesting. I mean, if he were to to give a clinic, he might just very well teach classical judo, you know. And 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 to me, that will be endlessly frustrating because if I were to go for a Takato uh, clinic, I want to see how he does all those uh, amazing competition techniques. I'm not there to watch him do classical techniques, you know, but, but that's what often happens. So, yeah, I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's just the, the way it is. And, and I, I, I think it has a negative impact. And like I say, I stand by what I just said, which is that judo probably stands alone as the only Olympic sport where 
the way it is taught is often at odds with the way it is played. And you don't see that in other sports. That statement is fascinating and it's 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 obviously factual, right? Uh, but it's also ironic and uh, I don't know what other key words. Frustrating. Frustrating, <laughs> for, for, for sure, to, to some extent. And I mean, not everyone who trains the sport necessarily gets to or wants to compete, be it at a recreational or uh, competitive, you know, level all the way to the worlds or to the to the olympics i mean the probability of that is is is, is very slim but the fact that that it's not being taught the way it's played is mind-boggling i just this morning i just finished we watching uh the fifa world cup women's uh columbia versus uh england you know and and i just thought about what you said the way you know the game is taught is not the way it's played and i'm like do you imagine any other sport? <laughs> you know, no, it, it doesn't happen. That's it, it doesn't happen in any other sport. It doesn't happen. Judo stands even, alone. That's it. Even archery or those sorts of sports. Like I, I you know, uh, it's it's taught the way it's played. Right. It's taught the way. Right. Every other right. sport is taught the way it's played. Judo stands alone in that because I, 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 I've tried to think of is there any other sport where it's not taught the way it's played, and I can't think. I can't come up with anything, and so. Judo stands alone in that sense, and uh, and uh, it's very frustrating. But you know, what can you do? I mean, you know, that's I, how uh, it is. For sure, I, I hope you write more about that because I find that really, uh, you know, as someone who who likes the content uh, you produce, I I find that fascinating. You know, from from you know, as a sports fan who watches other sports, that fact about this sport in terms of how it's trained. Like it's, it's there, there's something really ironic, but magical about it. Now I, I want to move on to the next question here. Um, we're, we're talking about emphasizing full force practice with safety in the article, you emphasize throwing with a hundred percent force and using, utilizing a crash pad. How can instructors cultivate an environment where students can practice with full force, but also ensure safety? Well, uh, and, and sorry, but before you answer, uh, I don't mean to rudely interrupt that. I remember that part in the article really stood out to me where the 100 percent force. And, and I think you went on. To, I should be quoting you directly from the article. But there, there's a part where you talk about, like, if you're not going 100 percent. You know, you'll never know. I'm paraphrasing here. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you won't know what it feels to fully throw an opponent. Right, and I found that really uh, interesting. Well, you see, in many judo, again, this this classical thing uh, comes into play, uh, where you know we we just talked about how uh, the way it is taught or the way it's practiced is not the way it is played, right? Uh, well, this 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 uh, has direct relevance to your question here. In in many judo clubs, not in all, but in many judo clubs, they don't use crash pads. Certainly in traditional judo clubs, they don't use crash pads, right? So when players throw, when uh, do throwing practice, when they do nage komi, when they're doing repeated throwing practice, what they do to save their uke from being battered, right, is that they'll, they'll lift a little bit. They'll throw, and just as the uke is about to impact on the ground, they, they actually literally lift up to cushion the impact, right? Mm -hmm. If not, if you do 20, if you throw somebody, with Ippon Seonagi 20 times with full impact, they'll die, you know? I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll be in the hospital. You know, I mean, you, you can't take 20 throws, you know, repeatedly without a crash pad, right? So when they do it, they lift a little bit so that it cushions the impact, right? But that's not the way you throw. That's not how you learn to throw, right? So we've had visitors come to our judo club before who come from dojos where they don't use crash pads. And although we had a crash pad in place, a thick crash pad, and we said, throw with all your might. Just go all out. There's a crash pad. Don't worry about it. Psychologically, they could not get themselves to do it. They could not because they don't want to hurt their opponent, uh, their, their partner. Mm -hmm. And I told them, your partner is going to be fine. There's a crash pad to cushion the, the impact. But right. they couldn't bring themselves to do it. 
they they, they would actually lift a little bit or they'll they'll try to to to, to cushion the, the the throw, even though they know a crash pad is there because they've just been conditioned, you know, uh, that way. And and so if you if you if you do that repeatedly and that's your habit of of holding yourself back when you throw, how are you gonna be become a good thrower? Right, in randori and, and 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 so on. You can't finish the throw because you've never done it full force. So you've got to do it full force. That's why at my dojo, we have tons of crash pads. We have more crash pads per capita than any other judo club I know. You know, we have tons of crash pads, really, really tons of crash pads. And, and we make full use of them. And because of that, our players can do lots of nagekogi. Our players can throw full force and they can do lots of them because the uke doesn't get hurt. Mm. Uke has a, a, a crash pad there to, to save them, you know? And and so um, so how do you cultivate that? Well, you know, if if a, a sensei <clears throat> or a coach wants to cultivate that, he needs to invest in crash pads. And we have actually different types of crash pads. Uh, we have very thick crash pads for big throws, standing ipon seonage, uranage, Uchimata, big throws, right? You know, where the, the opponent flies through the air and lands, you know, slam on, on the on, on the mat. We have thick crash pads. We even have thin crash pads for drop seonagi, for drop techniques, mm. you know, or, or, or techniques where the impact is not so hard, but it's more of a, a drop, right? Or a rolling technique, right? More of a rolling technique. Then, 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 then we use thin crash pads. So we have different types of crash pads, and we have lots of them. It's interesting because yeah. I've seen the videos on on the KL Judo Instagram uh, of, of you know you guys utilizing the, the various crash pads, and I've never actually seen the small. You have like the big crash pads, and then you have different sizes. <laughs> I've, I'm only familiar with the big ones, like the. They're about say maybe a foot, um, what f- thirty centimeters or something like that. Uh, no, pardon me, more than that, more like two feet. So, t- t- uh, you know, like the, the the larger crash pads. Yeah. Anyways, I've only seen those uh, in terms of around here, but I've never seen all the very various different sizes. Yeah, yeah. It's cool that you guys uh, have a lot. I had a follow up question in regards. Uh, well, I, I got I got to tell you a story, an interesting story about this. Um, uh, to to show you how this uh, this 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 traditional attitude about not using crash pad prevails, right? Uh, you know, I, I so I posted um, you know these videos on YouTube and 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 social media and so on, right. and somebody somewhere a uh, commentator posted something. I think it was on YouTube or. Maybe it was Facebook or something like that. And, and he says, very nice throws, you guys. But why do your players use crash pads? Don't they know how to break fall? And, and you know, so, I mean, I, I didn't even bother to respond, right? Because it's obviously a sarcastic comment. And, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, it has nothing to do with whether you know how to break fall or not. We're going to do, we're going to throw our partner 30 times or 50 times. They better use a crash pad, you know? Right. If they don't use a crash pad, we have to take our partner out in a in a stretcher. That's right. You know, you know right. so so yeah, so but but that, that type of comment, yeah, so that type of comment tells you the prevailing attitude. Oh, great throws, guy, but uh great great throws, guys, but uh don't your players know how to break fall? I mean, come on, what does that have to do with break fall, right? I mean, if you do an uranage or you know what's a hammerelli technique. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, imagine a habarali technique or a, a, a uranage, and 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 try doing that ten times on on a mat without a crash pad, right? You, do you, not do that without. Do not do that without exactly, a crash pad. Time out. Exactly, exactly. Right? But it doesn't have to be a throw that big. I mean, even say oinage or tayatoshi, you throw somebody twenty times with tayatoshi, they'll be black and blue. That's right. You know, and you want to have a training partner the next day, right? So, you know, uh, there, there's so I, much I, there. I, sorry, one more story. One, one more story. Sorry, Please. I tell you one more story. Um, I, I have I'm a coach from Germany. You know, from back in the day when I was uh, training, 
I was training in Germany, and this coach was telling me about uh, his uh, his time in Japan, and he used to train in Japan in the sixties. You know, he was a competitor from Germany, and uh, one of his uh, 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 of the people that he got to know at that time was a legendary Japanese uh, Olympic champion named Isao Okano. I'm not sure if you've heard of that name. Uh, legendary, yeah. Yeah. yeah, legendary person. But you know, Okano, uh, he went on on sort of like a, a, a clinic tour with Okano, who you know was demonstrating techniques. And Okano used him as a uke. And they didn't use crash pads, of course, because in Japan they don't believe in crash pads. So Okano would throw him to there, slam, boom, slam, boom, slam, boom, right? Repeatedly throughout the crash pad. And he said that. The next day, he one side of his body was all black and blue because of all those throws. You know, so, so that's not the way. That's not the way. That's that's the traditional way, but we certainly don't do it in KL Judo. That's not the way. I mean, you don't want your partners to be black and blue. There's yeah, absolutely. For for sure, there's risk of injury, being severely sore and hurt, as well as not potentially even, not, not even, even if it's not injury, right? No, I'm right. not talking about Boats, whatever. But imagine being slammed to the ground twenty times. You know, uh, it, uh, yeah, it's a uh, it, it's it's a big 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 issue for sure. If you're not landing yeah. safely, it's different when, when when you get thrown in Randori because in Randori it doesn't hurt because adrenaline's flowing, right. adrenaline's flowing, and somehow even if you get slammed, it doesn't really hurt because you know that adrenaline sort of protects you. But when you're doing nagekomi, there's no adrenaline flowing, you know, and and it, it does hurt, you know, unless there's a crash pad. Yeah, and of course you're emphasizing here for for the right. We're just saying that you're emphasizing when you're throwing a hundred percent, right? Yes, you should consider the. Well, which, which is the only way you you should throw. You should never throw ninety percent. You should never throw eighty percent. You should never throw ninety five percent. My philosophy is that if you're gonna throw, you throw a hundred percent. And the only way you can do that safely without hurting your partner is to use crash pads. Right. Um, the ah, geez, I, I think I had another follow-up question. I, I don't want to forget it. I should have written it down. Uh, geez. Oh, yes. The, the risk of concussion uh, is, is another thing, right? I mean, if you're, of course, if you're landing 10, 20 times and you're, you know, on the mats, you're being thrown at, as you mentioned, 100% full force. I mean, th there's a lot of risks, right? If you're not landing on a crash pad, of course, the assumption is one knows how to break their fall, but why, why put them, why put them through so much punishment? Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and not, you know, have them land uh, on, on a crash pad. Where, may I ask, where in Germany did you train? Which city? Uh, I, I was I, I trained at the Rusosheim Olympic Training Center, which is quite near Frankfurt. Okay, interesting. Uh, we're going to move on to the next question here. I'm hoping that my question, the other question I had, comes back. It might come back. Hopefully, okay. in terms of timeline, timeline and commitment to master a throw. While it's challenging to put a timeline on mastery, quote unquote, can you discuss the common pitfalls that might delay progress? And a follow up with that: What are the habits or traits of those who seem to learn more quickly? Right. Good question. Great question. Um, I think the 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 biggest mistake uh, uh, a player can make uh, is to be hesitant to do uh, to try techniques in randori for fear that it would fail or for fear that they would get counted. You know, some people uh, are very afraid of getting counted and some people just are afraid that it won't work. You know, they, they feel that if I do a technique, it should work. If it doesn't work, then it's a failure and I don't want to fail, right? That's the wrong mindset. You, you, you've got to fail many times. You've got to try, you know, and I often tell my players that uh, every time your technique doesn't work, you're learning something new. You're learning yet another way for that you're learning yet another way the technique doesn't work. So if you keep on doing it, eventually you'll run out of ways for the technique not to work. And then you'll come up with a way for it to work, right? So 
you just got to try. You got to try, try, try until it finally works. Until you come up with a way to make it work. And there is. I do see this phenomena among certain players where there's a hesitancy, hesitancy to try the te- the very techniques that they want to to master. You know, somebody can say, "I would like to develop the side takedown," or "I would like to develop a seoinagi," but they don't try it. If you don't try it, how are you going to ever develop it? Right. So, and then on the other hand, you do have those players who are very adventurous and they will try anything. You teach them something, in Randori, they'll try it. You know, you don't even have to remind them. You don't even have to say, hey, you know, make sure you try it. They'll try it. And those are the ones who, who pick up techniques quite fast because they're willing to try. So right. the biggest pitfall, biggest mistake is to be hesitant to try in Randori. What kind of athletes do you like to coach as a coach who what what are the characteristics you you look for in in your athletes and and if you could kind of give us an idea of you know who do you who would you like to ideally coach okay another great question you've you're a master interviewer you've you've come up really <laughs> I, I think these these are great questions because uh um I, I think the, these are things that need to be addressed, right? And these are things that people need, need to know about and people want to know about, right? Okay, so when you say athlete, what kind of ad, athletes do I like to coach? Um, are you talking about competitive athletes who... Absolutely, uh, yeah, com- competitive. You're, yeah. you're not talking about recreational, right? Because no, Not at all. No, I'm looking, okay. at your, I'm looking at your content. I'm reading the stuff. Competition. And, yeah, right. and okay. I'm, man, who, who is your so, so ideal... You, in a competitive uh, uh, scenario, right? In a context of a competitor who wants to go for IJF or maybe wants to go to world level, is that what you're talking about? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. So so let's say an an athlete uh, tells me, coach, I want I want to go take my judo as far as I can possibly take it. You know, if possible, world level, if possible, Olympic level, right? Mm. If, if an athlete tells me that. Um, this is uh, 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 the the first thing I would would ask them, and and, and I borrowed this from uh, a coach named uh, Nick Saban, right? Uh, it, it's something that I saw on uh, on 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 social media. Nick Saban, and 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 he says, first thing he asked them is that, do you know what you want exactly, right? And 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 they might say, yeah, I, I want to be a national champion. You know, or I want to be a, a, a regional champion, or I want to be world champion, or they, yeah, they usually know what they want. Then he asks them this very crucial question: Do you know what that entails? And I would say ninety nine percent of the time, they don't know what it entails. Most of the time, they grossly underestimate what it entails. And uh, they think that oh yeah maybe I'll I'll train three times a week, and you know I'll become world champion. No, you won't become world champion training three times a week. You won't become world champion training five times a week. You got to train full time, right? You got to if you want to be world champion. So the, the, a lot of people grossly underestimate what it takes. Uh, whatever their goals may be, you know, most people grossly underestimate. Some realize what it takes, and then, uh, and, and uh, but, 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 they're a minority, and so, uh, the the kind of athlete that I would like to train, uh, and and my answer might surprise you because you might think that I would describe somebody who's naturally talented and all this. No, it, it's all about mindset. To me, it's all about mindset. It's an athlete who knows what he or she wants knows what it entails and is prepared to do what it entails. That, that, that you know, more so than physical attributes, more so than natural talent and all these, those are, are useful. Somebody with natural talent and strong aptitude and physicality. Of course, every coach wants to have a very athletic person who 
has, who's, you know, who's very agile and fast and has strong aptitude and has natural talent. Every, every coach wants that, but more so than, than all these physical attributes is, is, is the mindset, the mentality that I know what I want. I know what it entails and I'm prepared to do what it entails. I'm prepared to make the commitment. I'm prepared to make the sacrifices. Right? If if I can find an athlete like that, that's the athlete I want. Wow. Do you offer virtual coaching? Like have people reached out to you and said, hey, I want to talk to you. I want to discuss the scenario right now with, with my judo. Here's what's working. Here's what's not working. This is my intended goal. How can you help me? Have, have, do, you, do you offer that? Uh, I don't currently offer that in any kind of formal capacity. But, you know, because I put a lot of stuff online through the right. website, social media, sometimes people will uh, message me out of the blue, you know, from other places. Yeah. Uh, sometimes from other states in Malaysia, sometimes from out of the country, you know, and uh, and 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 ask questions. Uh, and sometimes it, it it does lead to interesting conversations. And but sometimes, um, I I sometimes I can't really help them because I I I you know of the type of questions they ask. Like for example. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll give you an example. Uh, a guy, you know, used to write to me and say, you know, uh, I'm in this dojo here in you know my hometown, and you know, how can I train to to, to be more explosive, and how can I train to 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 you know uh, to develop more anaerobic capacity? I mean, these type of stuff. For one thing, you can just Google online and, and look it up, right? Right. And then secondly, I don't know the. You see, I'm also very careful to offer advice when. You know, when they come from another dojo and they may that dojo may have its own culture and their sensei may may be very sensitive about you know how how about their players getting advice from other coaches and all that. So you know, I when when somebody tells me things like that, uh, you know, they're from this dojo and they're not really uh getting what they want and they want advice from me, I'm I'm a little bit careful about about offering advice there, right? Mm. But where I've had good conversations is is from individuals who are actually uh quite well versed with judo, but uh and 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 they know the players on the IGF circuit and and they 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 actually have a a, a decent understanding of judo, and they're not asking very general broad questions like you know how can I improve my throws? That's too broad. Right. And then they might ask me where I find it interesting is that somebody will send me a clip and they say, Takato is, you know, doing this move. Um, you know, is he just being opportunistic or is that, a, does that look like a planned move to you? And, and did he engineer it? Right. And then, then, then I will look at the clip and then I'll give him my opinion. So th- those kind of stuff I find interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, but but what I don't find interesting is like, for example, uh, there there was one guy who uh, saw some 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 clips that we did on YouTube, and 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 uh, he would post something like, "Can you get one of your students to demonstrate Sankaku Jime? I want to learn Sankaku Jime." I said, "Can't you Google that? I mean, well, why 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 are you asking me to purposely make a a clip of Sankaku Jime for you? I mean." I mean that that type of stuff I'm not interested in enter- entertaining, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but if somebody is, shows me a a clip and says, "Wow, have you seen this move before? What is he actually doing? Uh, was that grip uh, uh, an, an anomaly, or is that something that you know he he he's deliberately does, you know, to uh, to 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 as a precursor to an an attack? Okay, that type of conversation I like to have. So um I don't get a lot of those, but sometimes it does happen. And uh I and and I find those interesting. But you know I don't offer it in any formal capacity. 
but I, I do surprisingly get yeah you know questions uh, occasionally from from people from around the world you know who who would send questions and 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 ask me some things not not such detailed questions as your well crafted questions <laughs> but 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 uh, but but yeah uh, you know I I I do get questions. I I appreciate the, that that answer. I. Uh... I'm sure you get a, a lot of questions. I, I I see some of these questions sometimes on. Not, on not a lot, not a lot, and not a lot. It's not like I'm barraged with questions. No, but, I, you know, I, I, really people to ask. Yes. Pardon me. I, I meant to say also comments. Sometimes there are comments that yeah. people yeah. will leave, and and of course, you know, you, you run the, the KL Judo blog, but you also have other uh, well-known uh, judo, judo, judo crazy. Yeah. That's right, yeah. judo, judo related content. And I guess this, I didn't have this in my original set of questions here, and we're we're almost, our interview's almost done, but I, I want to know, I, in terms of ignorance in, in the martial arts slash judo community, as someone who's been following this sport and communicating on it and reporting on it, is there, do you find there's a lot of ignorance? Based on some comments that you see, like, you know, oh, they know how to break falls, right? So why are they using crash pad? Like, sure, snarky, sort of sarcastic things. And and, and I mean, those comments are probably not the key performance indicators of, of what ignorance <laughs> is within the, yeah. the, the judo community per se, but they speak towards maybe something, I guess. Um, I don't know whether it's ignorance or more of like, um, you, you do have a lot of Mr. Know-it-alls uh, you know who who comment, and the people who comment usually are Mister Know It Alls, and I find especially on Judo Crazy, right? Uh, I might post uh, a technique, and you know, uh, and 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 I'll say, oh, nice uh, Ashiguruma by Takato, for example. And you always get people very. That's not Ashiguruma. That's Harai Goshi. No, that's not Ashiguruma. That's Oguruma. You know. Or it looks more like a tayatoshi to me, you know, and right. and and a lot of them say it with uh with authority, mm. you know, with a certain definite definitiveness, like they know and you don't, you know. Oh, you're wrong. That's not uchimata. That's haraigoshi, or you know, or, and, and or, or on the ground, you know, you 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 might uh uh describe a strangle and you say that's quite a a, a unique strangle, you know, you don't see it a lot. Oh, I see it all the time. I see it all the time. This is common. You know, I, I mean, you know, people will, will, will post comments like that. Right. Or you'll say, oh, you know, this 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 technique hasn't, you know, been around for, for a while and we're seeing a re-emergence of it. No, it's been around. It's very common. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll write comments like Mr. Know-it-alls. You, you get a lot of that. Wow. Yeah. So people who are very sure of themselves that they know better than you. Hmm. Very, very interesting, my friend. Well, thank you very much for your time. I've taken about 90 minutes of your time. We, we've explored uh, all of this. I did have one last question here. If, if It's up to you if you want to answer it or not. I believe you did answer it uh, right from the top uh, in, in a very proactive, positive, and diplomatic way. But I'll ask you if you want uh, before, before we finish this. This one's called Critique on Classical Approach. The article critiques the classical approach, indicating that it might not work in modern randori. Uh, do you believe that the classical approach still holds any merit or value in contemporary judo? Why or why not? Okay. Well, I mean, some techniques, some classical versions of techniques do work. You know, like, for example, um, uh, do, do you know what's called Uchigari? Are yes. you familiar with yeah, it? Yeah. 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 So the, 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 the classical version of Kouchigari works well. So it's fine. Classical version of Kouchigari works well. And uh, so I have no issues with that. So I'm not a person who would make a blanket statement that all classical techniques are useless. That's not true. Uh, there are classical versions of techniques that, that, that work perfectly. You know, uh, and uh, and and if they do work, and they are seen in competition, I, I you know which means that they work. If they are seen in competition, obviously they work, right? By definition, they work. Uh, then then I'll, I'll be glad to embrace it and teach it. 
But uh, the problem is that oftentimes the classical techniques don't work. But not all classical techniques don't work. Some do work. And so the ones that do work, we, we incorporate it and we do teach it at, at, at KL Judo. So uh, uh, I hope that answers your questions. That you know, I, I think your question is that, does it have any relevance? Uh, the ones that work do have relevance and some do work. Hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. I'm going to see if I can find some clips that I want to send your way. Uh, there's, there's, yeah, let I, me I, ask you one, one, one thing. Let me please, ask you. Like, please. You're, you're, a, you're a, a fan of judo. That's obvious, sure. you know, and you've yeah. done a bit of judo. And, 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 and um, let me ask you if you, you know, uh, as a fan of judo, wanted to learn to do a throw, any throw, whatever throw, right? And you wanted to learn to, to do a throw. What questions would you ask of a coach? Wow, jeez, that, that's <laughs> I, lo I love that question. I um, so I've had the I've I've had different coaches o o over the years, uh, yeah. and I've I've uh, I've seen different coaches coach, and I've uh, like informally spoken to to different coaches. One question I would ask is. Here's my body type. And, and, and this is probably related more to uh, someone getting older like myself, right? I'm not in my 20s. Uh, I'm not in my early 30s. You know what I'm saying? And, yeah. and uh, unfortunately, without getting too much in detail, I've, I've had some injuries, right? Uh, some, I've been dealing with some, some, some stuff. And uh, I'm okay, but I'm just saying I'm, I'm on my way back um, slowly but surely one question i would really ask i'd be curious to ask in general is here's my body type here's my level of mobility here's my strength based on this criteria can you isolate not 20 but two or three throws i should be focusing on in, in randori uh in, in 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 every in every form uh because there's so many throws and there's so much to learn even if you're a recreationalist uh um right like so that's the sort of question i i, I would like to ask not only that but also oh am i cutting out can you hear me yeah okay my, no, my, you're frozen. the video is frozen but the audio right. is still good right no i guess so and another thing too is uh just gripping strategies at a very basic level understanding that uh because uh i will tell you this i have been grabbed by by judokas uh especially like competitor types and i've been grabbed like it's it's a whole different world it's a it's a whole different game you know and i'm by no means an expert as as you know i am a fan sure i've i've dabbled in these sports but Quite frankly, that doesn't really mean anything, does it? But I've been grabbed by people who, who do this on on a competitive level, and it's uh, it's frightening. I don't, you know, I may I may outweigh them, but I will tell you this: they have full control of me. Believe it yeah. or not. No, listen, we, we could we we could do a whole podcast just on you know uh, on on gripping. That's a that's a whole different uh, topic. But but let me try to answer your first question first. Sure. And then, then I'll, I'll I'll address the the gripping thing very briefly. So the the, the first question or, or the first statement you 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 made was that um, that you would like to ask about you know you you would like to ask a coach you know whether he or she could recommend a set of techniques for you right given your your situation yeah. your age your mobility whatever injuries you have and and, and so on right uh, and I I, I think. A good coach, a capable coach, uh, should absolutely be able to do that. Should absolutely be able to take in that information that you've given your age, have a look at your body type, understand what injuries you may have, what limitations you may have, what fitness level you're at, and be able to recommend a set of techniques. Uh, I think a, a capable judo coach should absolutely be able to do that. Uh, only problem is that not all coaches are are, are capable, mm. but a good coach 
absolutely should be able to give you a definitive set of two, three, four techniques. Right. That, okay, try this. Try this. You know, this will be safe for you. This will be good for you, given your situation. And, and if a coach can't do that, then maybe they're not that good. So absolutely, a coach should be able to do that, right? And quite yeah. quickly, just, you know, using the database that's in their mind. I right. mean, if, if, you, if, if you were present in my club and I could actually look at your body type and have a short discussion about your medical history and what, you know, what, what limitations you may have, off the top of my head, I would be able to give you three or four things that you, you, you could try. Mm. Yeah. So does that answer your question? Oh, I, absolutely. It does. And I, I've seen, I've seen some, uh, some videos where I could tell, um, you know, as you're coaching, you're in a way customizing for a particular yeah, exactly. player. You know, and, yeah. and, and I love seeing that. Uh, of course, it's, it's integral to that person's, I, I feel, when you customize, you're leaning in on what they have, what, you know, as you mentioned, what they can do. And, yeah. you know, you see potential possibly as well to see, hey, maybe they can reach higher. But uh, I, I think that sort of approach yeah. is, is, is valuable. With regards to gripping, I mean, like I said, gripping is a, a whole nother topic in itself. And it's a it's a very big thing at KL Judo. Uh, as you, you know, uh, and, and it's largely... I, actually, I tell you, because of my judo upbringing in the United States, gripping mm. is a big thing among uh, America, top level training centers in America, right? Jimmy Pedro teaches it, Shintaro Higashi teaches it, all, all those uh, top level uh, places uh, in America, they, they really, really, really emphasize gripping. And I think the reason has to do with the fact that, you know, if it, uh, judo is quite niche in America, right? Uh, compared to say Japan or Russia or France or, or, or Brazil where there's lots of judo, right? There's not right. so much judo in America. And so you need to have uh, gripping, good gripping, good strategic gripping as uh, as your competitive advantage, right? Because you, you don't have, you know, uh, uh, the kind of depth and breadth that, that, that you have in Japan, mm. right? So you only have a center with only maybe a handful of top athletes, not a whole room full of athletes to play with. So you you know you don't you can't do two hours of randori and get all that experience and all that exposure that the Japanese have. So you have to do very strategic, uh, systematic gripping. Right. You know, and, and be taught that. And I was taught that when I when I had my training in the United States and. Uh, I, th- I think it's because of that background that I had uh, that, that that I also emphasize it a lot at my club. So, you know, people who come from other clubs who visit us, uh, especially those who come from traditional clubs, where they don't do a whole lot of grip fighting, very traditional Japanese style. They just grab and they just move around, right? And and they don't do... They, they, they all comment. They say, everybody in your judo club grip fights. And I said, yeah, you know, that's the culture here, you know. And and it's very interesting because uh, I tell you, you know, when we have beginners join our club, we don't usually off the bat teach strategic gripping to beginners. We teach them techniques first and if they stick around long enough and they get better, then we start to teach gripping. But mm-hmm. usually we don't straight away, you're a white belt, we teach you strategic grouping. No, usually you just learn a few techniques first and then you know, if you stay around long enough and you seem to be serious about judo, then we'll start to teach you grouping. But, you know, early on, you don't, you don't learn it. But if you watch our white belts, even before they are taught gripping, they grip fight. I mean, mm. they're, just mi- they're just mimicking what they see. You know, if everybody in the club, all their seniors, everybody is grip fighting, you know, when in Rome, do as Romans do, right? You go right. there and, and, and everybody's grip fighting. They'll just grip fight even if they don't know how. And they're just mimicking what they see or what they think is grip fighting. And 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 I, I find that interesting because there was one day I was just watching a few of our white belts. And I said, I've never taught that guy grip fighting. I've never taught that girl grip fighting. And she's down there grip fighting. Right. You know? That's and, awesome. And it's because, because, because that's the culture, right? right? That's the culture of the club. By osmosis, they pick it up. 
you know. And so, but, but 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 let's save this for another podcast where we can just do an entire ninety minutes on gripping. For sure, for sure, and and even the, the topic of cultures is a is a recurring one in in very in important, right? Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm curious to explore that. I, I tell you, there's probably a hundred and one topics. Oh, for sure, explore, for sure. You know? so, for sure. So this could be a series that that you know one day we talk about club culture, another day we can talk about gripping, another day we can talk about mental training, another day we can talk about you know fitness and conditioning for for judo, another day we can talk about fighting spirit. Another day we can talk about injuries. I think there's endless topics that we can explore. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for, for joining us here. And if folks will want to read up on, on the, if they want to read this blog or, or read more and see more cool videos that you produce, uh, they can check it out at kljudo.com. I'm going to have all the links in the episode description. Thank you very much for your time. I know my screen is frozen, but I'm still here. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> yeah, I can. I can do. All right. Thanks very much. You know, uh, I have to say, uh, excellent questions. You know, excellent questions. You you, you really came up with, uh, you know, the, the the kind of questions that I would like to answer. Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. And more importantly, an excellent article. And I hope you write more. All these questions are based off your, your, your from me reading your article and trying to kind of challenge the, the the narrative you know what i'm saying to so try to yeah, ask uh that could be our uh, our uh, uh uh modus operandi you know where, where sure. maybe i'll write an article about gripping and then you can read that article about gripping and from there you can come up with questions you know that works for me man yeah love that all right all right okay. have a good day right, or good evening bye-bye good night bye